Okay, so today it's a little bit of a dry subject is orthotic materials and it's I've been giving presentations about orthotic materials for years and it's always very very hard to try and make it kind of lively and interesting because as I say it can can be quite a dry subject but it but it is very very important so um, so we're going to be looking at some orthotic materials today um, this is kind of what what we want to go through so um, so it can be a dull subject, but unfortunately it is essential and our, our knowledge about what materials do or, or some sort of insight into that is, is critical um, if, we're, if we're trying to treat conditions. Um, so we're going to be looking at a few thoughts around orthotic materials um, and the effect um, or the effect that different um, clinical choices um, can, can have on our outcomes. Uh, but I think in order to do that, to start with, we need to think about um, why we make the orthotic materials, um, why we make the, the choices that we do. Um, a lot of that um, comes down to what we've done historically. Um, also questioning whether we're aware uh, of new developments. Um, but one of the things I'm going to do is gonna, we're going to have a little peep at some of the ways um, the research is conducted um, on orthotic materials. Um, I'm not going to go into great, great depths about that. We're just going to sort of focus on, on how we research uh, shock attenuation, but I'll come to that in a little while. And um, we're also going to look at what difference combining different materials with different properties makes. So, so all in all, today's webinar is not about me giving you as much as I'd like to. It's not about me giving you um, a list of different materials and then saying what conditions they're good for. Uh, but it's more about making you think and question the choices that you make. And so you may stick to using the same materials and padding materials you always have. Um, but as, as long as you sort of thought about it and got good, good reasoning for that. Um, now, I haven't covered every single orthotic material and I haven't really focused at all on the plastics and the carbon fibres. Uh, as I say, otherwise it will be me droning on about all the different properties of goodness knows, knows how many materials for, for hours on end. But if anybody's got any specific questions about the materials that I haven't mentioned in the presentation, by all means, ask some questions at the end uh, and I'll answer, I'll answer what I can. Uh, now, one of the things that I've noticed this over the years, um, there's a lot of confusion out there about what materials do and also what we call them. And I think often branded names get confused with actually what the product name is and then vice versa. So sometimes we'll refer to things like PPT and Poron as PPT and Poron, but that, that's actually a brand name. Um, but in actual fact, um, they are both um, polyurethane foams. That's what the what they are. So something like a polyurethane firm may have a uh, foam rather might have several different names or brand names attributing to that. And then they all might have slightly different properties. Um, but essentially, a lot of the time we're calling one thing under various different names and sometimes people can get that confused. Now, this is a paper here. It's not a particularly new paper. Uh, it's quite an old one. Um, but a chap called uh, Rome um, reviewed the most popular materials used by podiatrists and then divided them um, into seven groups. So the list he came out with was um, polyurethane um, elast elastomers, so things like um, uh, sorbethane, um, polyurethane foams, so your clear ones, your PPTs, poor ones, uh, polyethylene foams, so things like Evazote, um, Freelon, uh, Plastazote, uh, polyvinyl chlorine foams, ethyl vinyl acetate, um, or our good old EVA, which I think everybody uses, uh, synthetic rubber foams, um, neoprene and Spenco, um, and also silicon rubber. So now this was an American study, so it doesn't really look into to what um, UK clinicians use. Um, and as I say, these are more um, sort of softer and, and cushioning materials rather than looking at, at the plastics um, and the carbon fibres. But, but essentially he sort of put everything or this, um, this piece of research categorised everything into seven different types of material that are really uh, commonly used. Uh, so I think really what what influences our choice and why do we use the materials we do? Well, a lot of it can depend on where you work and what you've got availability for. Sometimes it might be a, a lovely idea to use all these different new materials. But if you work at an NHS clinic and you've only got EVA, well, then that's what you have to work with. Um, but I remember, I mean, when I was a student and I first started to dabble in, in materials and orthoses, uh, I remember one night um, going out and ironically I had a pair of purple shoes which were high rather like the ones in the picture here and I knew by about an hour into the evening they would be very uncomfortable because obviously it's tipping me forward onto the metatarsals um, so I thought well I just need some cushioning in here so I went up to the lab which was part of the university had a delve through the off-cut box and I mean the amount of different materials in there the different colours um, all of which felt soft and squidgy so I sort of thought I had a lot of choice there so naturally I picked out the purple one stuck it in the bottom of my shoe um, and after about five minutes it had completely compressed um, and didn't do any use whatsoever 
and that's because the material that I'd chosen was plasters oat. So I remember thinking at the time, well, plasters oat is pretty rubbish because um, it doesn't do anything and it bottoms out. But actually, we'll, we'll come on to plasters oat um, a little bit, a little bit later, and, and what 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 it is actually good for. So plasters oat is great for insulating and comforting, um, or conforming rather, um, but it's not great for for cushioning on its own, even if it is purple and match your shoes. So that that was my first, I think, experience of choosing completely the wrong material for the wrong job. Um, so just because something feels like it should do the trick, if you don't understand the properties of that material, it's, it's not going to have the desired effect. Uh, now, I'm going to touch briefly on a piece of uh, research which I did for my MSc uh, a few years ago. Um, now, primarily what I was looking at was material choices to improve um, shock attenuation. And it was all to do with uh, medial tibial stress syndrome. Um, but actually, the questions I asked highlighted uh, quite a knowledge gap um, in our understanding in the UK of material properties um, and what they do. So uh, the question I sent out, um, I got replies from 271 pods, uh, podiatrists asking about material choices and what they choose for shock attenuation. Uh, and I was quite surprised when 12 different materials came back. And the, the closer I looked into it, I realised that a lot of them were vastly different in composition, performance and intended use. Um, and the reasons people had chosen these materials was many and varied. Um, so it was, a, it was a lot more diverse than, than I'd initially expected. Um, so this was the list. So a lot of people chose Poron, um, Astroshock, Poron XRD, uh, EVA, but actually of all densities. So bearing in mind we're talking about shock attenuation. Um, we did get a few people um, saying they'd use high density EVA, um, polypropylene, which of course is a plastic, carbon fiber, which is uh, an even harder property. So there was, there was quite a variation um, in that, um, as I say, and there were the reasons why they chose it. So the, the results I expected to get was just a couple of um, soft shock attenuating type materials, not, not that diversity. So it kind of um, highlighted, I guess, um, a knowledge gap, um, perhaps in our own profession, really. So the clinical reason behind it, um, one of the biggest ones was availability due to uh, budget restrictions. And I can completely empathise with that, having worked for the NHS. Um, sometimes you have to work with what you have. A few people did talk about layering different materials to sort of um, get the better properties um, out, of the, out of the materials based on, on combining the two together. Uh, some said preventing uh, presenting foot biomechanics. Other people talked about footwear choice, and of course that that's very very important. We might want to put six mils of something in, but if they've got very very narrow footwear or low um, depth footwear, then that isn't an option. And and one thing that came up a lot was um, historical. So this is what we've always used. This is what my predecessors used. This is what my peers use. Um, so this is what we stick to. Um, there wasn't an awful lot about discussing new materials or any new research or sort of any relevance to that. Um, interestingly as well, material thickness um, and consideration to how materials behave in different environments um, wasn't even mentioned as important factors. So people didn't really consider that whether it was cold or the humidity was different, whether that changed the properties, so which was, uh, which was quite interesting. Um, and that sort of leads on really to the fact that there is good evidence out there to show that material um, thickness, um, specifically in relation to shock attenuation, um, does change with the thickness. Um, and actually this can alter the, um, the, the uh, rigidity of the device too. Now we'll talk a little bit about rigidity in a few slides time and the importance of that with, with shock attenuation. Um, but the paper here found that actually humidity and temperature um, can alter the properties of the material too. And if you think about it, um, and I'd never thought this before until I read the paper, but then I thought actually I've left poor on um, and PPT in the boot of my car overnight in January when it's been freezing cold. And when you feel it in the morning, it is quite hard. Um, and it doesn't quite have the same cushioning and shock properties as it does at a normal room temperature. So, um, which kind of makes sense when you think about it. Um, but the other thing is humidity. So if you're putting cushioning materials or shock attenuating shoes in maybe a runner's or uh, materials in a runner's shoe, um, is that going to differ or are the properties going to differ depending on how much their feet sweat or how far they run or the humidity? So um, so that that's quite an interesting concept as well. Um, and I suppose it also makes us, us question how often we should we be replacing those materials um, if the properties aren't lasting for as long as they should be. 
Um, so essentially the paper says as the thickness of certain materials increases, the shock absorbing capacity increases too. So the thicker you go, so if you're putting PPT or porn in for shock attenuation, the thicker you go, the more shock absorbing capacity it will have, which I guess makes sense. But again, you're, you're going to be struggling with um, fitting stuff uh, into footwear, so that needs to be considered too. Um, and also the rigidity of, of some materials changes uh, with specimen height. Uh, so what actually constitutes um, shock absorbing capacity? Well, if we, we go back to my first story at university, it was the squidge factor. So squidging a piece of material with your fingers and thinking, yep, that feels soft, but 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 no. Um, now, I'm not going to go into all the different types of research methods for all the different types of padding and shell, shell materials out there, because as I say, it's quite dry and I'll be going on for ages and the research isn't that great anyway. Um, but I'm going to touch a little bit on measuring shock attenuation, just so you, you kind of get the gist of um, sort of how complex it can be and some of the things you need to consider. Um, also, I mean, some of you may have seen um, the drop test where you drop um, a hard object or a ball bearing onto a material. Um, just because you drop a heavy ball bearing onto a given material doesn't mean it gives you um, all the information. And I'll talk a little bit about the, the drop test in a minute. So, what actually tells us if a material has good shock absorbing properties um, and what should we consider if we delve into the research? So if you're a bit of a um, research boffin or you, your shock attenuation or, or those sort of materials are, are things that come into your practice a lot, if you're treating runners or, or medial tibial stress syndrome, or even if you're, you're fitting um, orthoses into boots of safety boots, um, fireman's boots, policeman's boots sort of, um, that kind of work footwear where they're tramping up and down all day on hard surfaces um, this might be sort of something that, that's worth considering or looking into. Um, so it's a bit of bit of the geeky bit here really and um, so the two most important factors for the study of materials intended for shock absorption or shock attenuation two things you want to be looking for is energy absorbing capacity um, so how much energy it absorbs as, as you impact um, and that is also known as the loss tangent so if you're reading the research loss tangent basically means how much energy that um, that material absorbs um, but also the rigidity um, of the material the, the, the confusing bit is that these two aren't necessarily correlated but by looking at the two things independently and then kind of together um, it gives you a bigger picture um, of how that material behaves so essentially low rigidity and high loss tangent um, means you've got a better shock attenuating properties um, than a material that's got high rigidity um, and a low loss tangent. So as I say, keep save that slide or keep that slide because it, um, it takes getting your head around a little bit sometimes. So in research terms, we're not looking at the maximum force and that's what you'd get from a drop test, which is dropping a ball bearing onto a, a piece of uh, material. Um, we're looking um, for low rigidity and high loss tangent uh, and as I say it's important to look at both because it gives you much much more information about the behaviour of that material. Uh, now there's two different ways to do testing, um, one is with actual live people, actual subjects, um, which I guess is more real um, but the trouble with this kind of research is there are a lot more variables to consider and it's harder to control um, because each subject won't be identical. Also the conditions are a lot harder to control with things like heat and humidity so it definitely works um, so if you're looking at specific conditions um, then subject testing uh, might be the way you'd, you'd go forward and that could be good but if you're actually looking at material properties and you've got subject testing there's so many other factors involved that it's very hard then to determine results. So generally speaking, mechanical testing uh, tends to be the preferred method, um, and then this can be subdivided too. And as we've already mentioned, um, we've got um, the drop test, but all that measures is um, force, acceleration, and then the deformation, um, which is then left, so the indent, if you like, which is then left on the material. Um, and then there's uh, mechanical testing, which looks at the stress strain relationship of that material. Um, and it's looking at the stress strain relationship, which gives us that information about rigidity and loss tangent, which I will explain in a little more depth. So, oh, excuse me. So, drop test, um, this is common in marketing literature, and I think that's because it's a nice, simple test. It's very, very visual. Um, so, you can drop a ball bearing onto a piece of material. If it bounces, it's not absorbing shock. And if it just completely absorbs all the shock and just lands almost dead on the material, you know it has absorbed shock. Um, but it does have limitations, so you have to think about things like the dropping mats, um, what height you've dropped it from, so um, 
if you're dropping it from a higher height or a lower height, that's all different variables which need to be um, for the research point of view that has to be be considered. Um, also, then can you relate that to actual somebody walking around having a pair of insoles in their shoes relating to the height you might have dropped it at, so it's not giving you necessarily the correct information. Also, the area of contact, so how big's your ball bearing, how big's the, the material that you're using. Um, and essentially, the, the most important part about that is um, that it only gives you peak magnitude. So it's only giving you the force at the end of it. It's not telling you about how the material behaves sort of leading up to um, and then unloading um, as well. So and there's a, a good paper by Benno Nig, um, which uh, looks into that into more details. Also, with the drop test, it doesn't consider any of the environmental conditions. So you can't really change much of that either or you can't, can't regulate it too well. Okay, and then there's this monster of a machine here, um, which uh, looks at stress and strain testing. Um, and this machine here is called the Instron E3000 Universal Testing Machine. And essentially, when you see it working, it just basically hammers up and down. But you can set it to different rates. You can control humidity. You can you can be much more specific with this. And what it looks at is compressive stress, uh, compressive deformation, and um, hysteresis uh, ratio, which again, you know, starts to sort of not go over your head so much, but you just think, how relevant is this to me? Um, but what it actually does um, is, is once you get the sort of the research and the results from it, um, is it looks at loss tangent and it gives you the dynamic rigidity that can be explained by exploring the stress strain ratio. Um, and I'll give you um, uh, a graph um, to show you how to do that in a tick. So essentially it allows the researchers to see the fuller picture in terms of material properties rather um, than just, just one aspect of it. Um, the only thing is you've got to be careful with loading rates. If you're reading research on it, look at what the rating, loading rate is, as this is sometimes slower than it might naturally occur in the shoe. So if you are looking at a piece of uh, a paper or, or work with this, um, do bear in mind that loading rates need to be, um, if you're going to be using it for clinical practice, you need to think about the loading rate being similar to that of, of what's occurring within the shoe. Okay. So feast your eyes on this. Um, so this is an example of a stress strain graph. Um, and in this instance, it's just showing, showing different types of um, poron, um, which is a polyurethane. So if you look um, on the far right, uh, the softest material, which actually measures um, a shore 14. So that's really soft, really squidget, squidgy. What you can see from that, because you've got the dynamic strain along the bottom and pressure um, or stress going up the side there. So number 14, so the red line on the far right, that exhibits the most amount of strain. And then the harder material, which is a shore 55, and that's all the way over on the left hand side, that's the blue one, that displays um, the least amount of strain, because um, you've got hardly any strain going along, it's pretty much going straight up, um, which means it's less accommodating. So what this tells us, and we're going to ignore, ignore the other ones in the middle, but what this shows us is that the, the higher shore one, so the harder material, um, also has a steeper gradient, which shows that this material is stiffer. So the softer material um, has more strain, um, and the harder material um, is stiffer. Um, so the more pressure you put, the less, less it strains. Um, so that gradient um, is important to look at. But what's also important to look at is how the material unloads. So if we just pretend we've taken one of those lines and then put it on a stress strain graph, um, the blue line shows it as it loads, but then the red line shows what information, um, what happens when it actually unloads. So it's important to look at the gradient for stiffness, um, which gives you the rigidity, but it's also important to look at the area between the lines for the loss tangent or energy absorbing capacity. Um, and you can see it takes a bit of working out. Um, but if you're comparing several materials against each other, so you might have several of these graphs looking at different types of, might be different types of poron or different types of soft material. What you can do is compare one against each other. So you'd be looking at, um, looking at the gradient, but you'd also be looking at the areas between the line and it's kind of getting the optimum of those two, uh, which is why sometimes it's easier to read the discussion part of the research rather than the methodology and the results. But it uh, depends how much you like reading research. Um, so as you can see, it can also, it can be a bit confusing um, if you don't understand what's being researched and why, um, it doesn't necessarily give you the, the, the information that you need. So generally speaking, it's thought that a stiffer material um, will absorb less shock. 
um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that a soft material is is shock absorbing and we know that with plaster zote so just because it feels soft and it's not very rigid doesn't mean it's good at shock attenuating and that's because of the unloading properties so shock absorbing materials so some materials can in fact be quite rigid so not, not like really really rigid like plastic um, but it's about getting that fine balance in between being the right rigidity and also having the right amount of space in between the graphs the amount of um, of, of lost tangent in there as well Right. Now, when it comes to material research in general, and we'll come away from sort of shock attenuation now and be a bit more general, um, as usual, it does get a bit grey. So um, material research uses a wide range of methodologies to examine a wide range of materials. Um, so that means that it's very, very difficult to compare one study against another. Um, also very um, difficult to evaluate the best properties and that's because there's, there's as I say the research is so diverse um, there's a lot of confusion over trade names and materials and labouring um, of characteristics um, so all in all this can be really really confusing so when I looked into this I was hoping to find a nice um, systematic review or a nice meta-analysis which kind of brought all the research together and kind of I don't know did all the work for me if you like um, but all I found was lots of um, issues and people saying it was really, really really difficult to do because there was so much diversity uh, more so with the with the methodologies uh, and this is what Healy found in 2010 when when she tried to do this and what she concluded was that recommendations on the most suitable material for foot orthoses were completely dependent on the researchers methodologies um, and we know already um, just by looking at um, just shock attenuation alone there's there's completely different ways of doing that research which is you know so if you did all those different types of research be it subject testing mechanical testing drop tests using the Instrom machine um, you might be doing all of that on the same material and then end up getting very different results from it which which can be confusing um, so she also found that many papers use different methodologies um, and the conclusion kind of was that clinical recommendations are then not possible because it's very difficult to compare so um, so like I said it's not specifically looking at shock attenuation with this um, but there's end and different, endless different formations um, of materials and then of course you've got endless different thicknesses of each material and then there's wide ranges of um, types of material within sort of one um, brand, if not brand, but it's various different brands within within one type of material. So you can see it's uh, it gets confusing. Maybe that's why we just stick to using soft density EVA rather than asking lots of questions. I don't know. Uh, okay, so let, let's just take a step back now and think about the material choices we make for an orthotic. Um, so for a prescription. Um, and how these can vary and why and um, one of the things I often get asked specifically in relation to, to working with a lab is um, you know what material should I use um, what can I do with certain parts of the prescription to make a difference and, and again the more I look into it the more questions I ask and the more experts I speak to I think the less answers to get and the less clear I almost become on it um, but essentially shell materials behave so we're talking more about the harder materials now and as I say, I'm not going to split it down and talk about all the properties of um, polyurethane, uh, polyurethane, polypropylene, um, polyethylene and top pearl and carbon fibre because you know I can write information about that another time but generally speaking with the stiffer shell materials that you'd use for making orthotic um, different things you do with the prescription can affect um, the properties of that material so heel cup height affects arch stiffness so if you manufactured exactly the same device with the same prescription when I say prescription I mean the control you put in the rear foot or or forefoot um, and the same material and the only difference you made was changing the heel cup height so if you made one pair of devices with no heel cup and one pair of devices with just your normal 12 or 14 mil um, heel cups on what you find is that the arch would be stiffer um, in the device which had the heel cup on okay um, heel posts also affect heart stiffness so if you again if you made two pairs of devices um, with the same material um, same size and so on and so forth but one of them you put a six degree intrinsic post and one of them you put a six degree extrinsic post um, then you'd find the one with the extrinsic post made the arch stiffer so just just having a higher heel cup and adding an extrinsic post is going to make um, the arch area of your device stiffer uh, and that might bring up questions um, 
or more solutions perhaps if you've got a patient that comes back and the, the stiffness of the device generally is okay but they can't tolerate what's going on underneath the arch that you know you could think about changing the prescription variables changing the height of your heel maybe um, or doing an intrinsic post rather than an extrinsic post so that they tolerate that better that, that could be something that you consider but the, essentially what I'm saying there is you're using the same material but by just changing the slight things on the prescription you're changing the behavior of that material um, four foot posts as well behave differently depending on material stiffness so if you put a four foot post on a um, I don't know, a medium density EVA device or something like a, a top rail material where you've got a lot of flexibility the, um, in, in, the, um, in the material then what you'll find is that if you've, if you've posted the forefoot because the material isn't stiff enough or if you use a soft, softer stiffness material then you'll end up creating sort of a twist in the mid tarsal joint area so what you're doing at the forefoot then um, won't go through to the rear foot because the material is not stiff enough to accommodate that so the general thought with putting four foot posts on um, is that you need a stiff material to transfer those forces back to the rear foot as well of course then the question comes out is why are you putting the four foot post on in the first place so i mean it might be that you're just bringing the ground up to to meet the foot um, might be that you're offloading but if you're trying to correct the position of the foot um, then think about what that's doing to the mid tarsal joint if, you, if your material is not stiff enough um, oh let's get my mouth full of coffee um, the other thing is um, materials differ between manufacturers so just because you buy polypropylene um, if you're buying it from different manufacturers that might have slightly different um, properties as well and that does tend to vary when um, distributors and things like that change so not a huge amount um, and it's, I think it's more noticeable if you manufacture what they see so you'll notice things like um, the heating of the materials or the gluing of the materials or they might just behave slightly different because of the supplier um, and then these suppliers don't also always um, disclose changes which they've made to the manufacturers so you might be using the same material from the same supplier for years and then one one day it just doesn't quite behave when you're manufacturing um, as well as you thought previously so there's all sorts of things like that so um, so from that I think in a nutshell what I'm trying to say is it's very difficult to write a protocol or write a nice list of um, what materials you should use for for what condition or what patient because it, it does differ and it does does depend on so many different variables but um, the idea and hopefully what you'll get from this presentation um, is making you you think about it and think about the considerations uh, that you need to think about when you're doing a prescription um, yeah not just normal not just um, prescribing orthoses either um, also if you're just making um, off-the-shelf devices or even um, uh, flat simple insoles as well as I say it's still quite important to to, to think about that um, oh my list goes on yeah so also what's the manufacturing processes so if you are doing casted devices um, whether you're having a direct mill device where it's milled out with a CAD CAM machine or vacuum formed that could differ because with vacuum forming you're heating the material so what effect does heat have on it whereas direct mills you're not directly heating it um, also there has been some discussion um, and I've forgotten where I've seen it now but it was a debate with direct milling um, that the pattern of milling um, could create certain weaknesses in the device or change the structure of the device so some mills go round and round and round and have lots of little circles on and some milling goes sort of side to side but if you're milling side to side does it matter if you're going front to back or side to side and does that affect the flexibility so as far as I'm aware there's um, no research into that at the moment but I wouldn't mind betting someone will probably look into that um, in the near future at some point uh, ever left poor on in the boot of your car in winter I've kind of mentioned that um, so if you're stocking materials in a cold clinic or a very warm humid clinic that's going to um, uh, affect how they behave um, and then yeah which pretty much brings me to that one so shock absorbing materials behave differently depending on the weather um, and again that's something worth considering if you've got marathon runners that you're treating and they're running in the winter compared to when they're running in the summer um, effect. Uh, so we'll just touch back on squidgy materials again now so um, polyurethane um, so PBTs and your pore and those sort of things um, and then polyethylene things like plasterzone so, so and you've probably read this in the list of literature um, so polyethylenes um, so these are what are called a closed cell so what happens is gas becomes um, pressurized aids and then it aids elastic recovery 
Um, compression set, on the other hand, means that there's a permanent deformation remaining um, when the force uh, which has been applied to it is then removed. So you end up with like a loss of thickness and then the, the property, the uh, material prop, um, bottoms out. So uh, plaster set is a very good example of that because um, once you put a, a footprint, if you like, on it, a permanent deformation is left and the material bottoms out. Whereas um, things like polyurethane, so pawns and PPTs, on the other hand, a closed cell. Um, so they become pressurised um, and they recover a lot quicker, so they're a lot more elastic. Um, so that's kind of the difference between the two there, even though initially if you've got three mils of both material, they kind of feel the same. Uh, so I'll touch on EVA here just because I think this is what well, it is. I know this is the most common material chosen for an off-the-shelf orthotic and also for custom made. And the most common of um, the EVAs is um, medium density as well. So again, no research on why this is probably because it's it's safe. It's not too hard. It's not too soft. It's a good sort of middle of the line, run of the mill material to use. It's also very cheap. Um, it's very easy to work with. It laminates easy. Um, it's heat moldable. It's what we've used for years. It's available in lots of different colours. Um, every lab pretty much uses it. Um, and again, it's a very safe material to use for an orthotic. Uh, but I think the question is, have you ever thought about um, the properties of EVA? Uh, well, in actual fact, I mean, this, again, this is quite an old study, but there, I know there are some more recent ones. EVA actually performs very poorly um, against the polyurethanes um, when it comes to shock attenuation um, and also longevity. So if you have a device made out of polyurethane um, and the same device made out of a poron, uh, not a poron, EVA rather, medium density EVA, again, they'll feel the same initially, um, but the polyurethane um, will last longer and keep its properties longer, uh, whereas the EVA will have a tendency to bottom out over a period of time. So it's cheaper, EVA is cheaper than polyurethanes, um, but then you've got to think about it. it might be a lower cost, but then what's the longevity and have you got to replace them? Um, so therefore, is it more cost effective in the long run? Um, right, where are we? Slide 27. So uh, material combinations. Um, so going back to the original questionnaire, um, some people did talk about combinations and they talked about plastics and carbon fibres and polyurethane and EVA and, and so on and so forth. Um, but multi-layered orthoses um, were specified by um, a number of participants. So we, you know, people are obviously considering this. Um, but nothing was particularly related to research. Um, so generally, choosing the right material for the right condition will improve conditions um, and combining certain materials can improve uh, results further. And there is a fair bit of research uh, in this area. So it's not necessarily brilliantly um, documented, but we do know that total contact here insoles using a combination um, can work very well for, for patients, uh, particularly with the at-risk foot. Um, so a lot of research looking at total contact insoles. Um, Barnett in 2006 stated that, that the loading time in flexible neuropathic feet can be um, greatly reduced by using functional foot orthoses, uh, but this was also, as I say, supported by other studies. So generally, um, what was used and what's considered is medium density EVA as your base, um, and that sort of forms, that helps um, keep the, the shape, if you like, of, of the device which you've, you've cast. Then you want a soft density um, EVA mid-layer um, or polyurethane mid-layer in there, so for your shock attenuation. Um, and then a plasterzote top cover, which will deform. Okay, and the reason for that... Um, sort of comes back again to the plaster zone um, and it's used with um, with um, PU. So in previous slides or the previous slides where I've mentioned plaster zone, I've almost inferred that one was better than the other um, because one bottoms out. But actually they, they complement each other really well um, if, if they're used together. So if you use um, a urethane base layer, so pour on a PVC on the bottom and then plaster zone on the top. Um, and that's really because plaster so readily moulds to the shape of the foot. So it's got its poor elastic memory properties, which we already mentioned, um, and that means it doesn't um, return to its original thickness, so it bottoms out. Uh, but actually what happens when it bottoms out is that, that if, and if it's the foot that's bottomed it out, it redistributes um, plantar force over a wider area. 
um, and then in combination with that the closed cell properties of the material underneath so your porn or your PPT mean that the cushioning aspect is still effective even though the top layer has conformed to the shape of the foot so when you so even if you're just giving um, a, sh uh, a flat insole here so if you, if, you, if you don't cast and you don't prescribe orthoses even if you're just doing a flat insole if, if you've got um, plaster so on the top and you've got a cushioning material preferably as uh, say porn or PPT on the bottom layer then you're getting the cushioning um, from the bottom layer but because the top layer conforms to the shape of the foot it spreads the load over a wider area and there's some some good research um, by Rogers and Birch in 2006 um, looking into the combination of these two materials so uh, and what it shows that they were it was having a combination of plaster and pore rather than just pore on its own was more effective at reducing peak, pre peak pressure um, and forced time integral integral um, underneath the forefoot um, and there's, there's other studies to substantiate that as well. And these are the sort of feet really you want to be using it for. Um, now this is a rheumatoid foot here, but then we see plenty of feet um, in elderly patients where literally you look underneath the bottom and just they've got no fatty padding, fatty padding left um, and that's what's causing the pain or the problem um, or the callus or the corns or the ulcers. Um, so if you've got feet with prominent met heads, as so it might not be rheumatoid feet, it might just be generally elderly care, or elderly patients that you see. Um, redistributing the load through the compression of the material um, works better at reducing that force rather than um, rather than it breaking down underneath the plantar surface of the skin. So with these sort of patients, if you can use a combination of something like plasticine and PPT or porum, then you're getting that cushioning, but you're also getting the top layer conforming um, to the well, to the lumps and bumps for want of a, a better description or or to the um, to the sublux metatarsal heads which you can see there so you're spreading the load over a wider area and you're also cushioning it as well so and again that doesn't have to be a custom orthotic that could literally just be a pair of um, flat two-dimensional insoles that you've cut out from those two materials stuck together um, so using materials in combination is, is well documented for the at-risk foot um, but then the more I looked into the research for more general conditions, it's not well documented at all. Um, so it's still frequently used, um, but when we're looking at things like plantar fasciitis or medial tibial stress syndrome or Alex valgus or Achilles tendinopathy or all the general conditions that we tend to see more, more specifically, there's very little, if any, um, research out there which gives you a good indication of what materials you be, should be using for those, those orthoses. So it's more about, as I say again, understanding the properties of the materials and then making your own clinical judgment based on that. So so, um, as I say, aside from the diabetic foot, where there's there's been more research, um, there's there's not too much out there, unfortunately. So final thoughts, again, coming back to thinking about what your clinical reason is behind choosing that material. Um, how much attention do you pay to the research? Uh, I can never stress enough how important it is to keep on top of what new stuff's coming out. But also it's very easy when you get a piece of research just to read the abstract, whereas it is important as well to look at the methodology. So looking back to what I was saying about shock attenuation, if we read all the abstracts for different um, different papers we might find it's conflicting or we might find they say certain things or they don't but then if the methodologies are all completely different then that might raise questions as well so it is very difficult reading the whole of research papers sometimes and I know I have that issue because I read really slowly um, but don't just read the abstracts um, the methodologies if you are only going to read one other part of it then read the discussion and also read the methodology as well because because that is a, an essential part of it there are in fact endless possibilities of combinations i've talked mainly about um a polyurethane and plaster so it's a combination but there's, there's so many different variations out there that you can try um, so really always comes back to the patient and also what footwear they're in, what their activities are, what they're doing for a job, what they're doing for leisure, um, what the environment is in which they're working in or doing their sport in or, or whatever the conditions that they're getting. So there's so many different variables that when you think of it like that, it's, you then can't produce a list to say, you know, this is the material you use for this job. Um, so it is confusing. As I say, there are endless possibilities. Um, and also sometimes I think if we paid too much attention to the research that's out there, we'd never try anything. To So to a certain extent with this, you kind of do need to try different things. Um, but if you've got a patient with an at-risk foot, obviously you have to be very careful about that as well. So just about the end of our 45 minutes now. So, um, so yeah, no answers in that, unfortunately, just more 
things to make you, you think. But if anybody's got any specific questions about materials, then if you type them in now, I'll answer what I can. Um, and again, I apologise because materials is a dry subject, but it's um, if nothing else, hopefully you'll, you'll question your practice at the moment and either be happy in the way for, for, for what you're doing or maybe think about new things for the future or, or things you ought to be considering. But also discuss with colleagues as well, because they might have found something that works, um, which they can share. thing I've got to mention as well is foot size can have an effect on things so when I was talking about the plastics and heel cups and heel posts and that changing the properties of materials um, obviously the size of the foot will be different as well so if you've got someone with size 13 feet and you've used a I don't know two mil carbon fibre shell that's not going to be as stiff as if you've made a child's size one orthotic which is much smaller so uh, foot size uh, can have a big effect on how an orthotic or how a prescription works as well. And then obviously body weight and, you know, that comes into it. <laughs> 